Well, welcome everybody to this event on the early morning of May the 5th. Uh, today's event run by the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making in Society is entitled Automated Decision Making in Social Security Employment Services, Mapping What is Known and What We Know. Um, this is the second of a series of events run by the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence. Um, my name is Paul Hedman and with Terry Carney from the University of Sydney, we will be both uh, chairing today's session. So I want to first begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on which uh, the University of Queensland, where I'm located uh, in Brisbane, the traditional owners on which our and the custodians of the land in which we meet are virtually. We want to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants and to recognise their continual cultural and spiritual connections to the country. These are the Jagara and Turrbal people. We also want to recognise their leaders, past, present and emerging. Um, and we also recognise the traditional owners from wherever you are joining us today. So thank you for everyone for joining us to this, uh, this event by the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence. Um, my name, as I said, mentioned is Paul Hedman from the University of Queensland. Uh, and Terry Carney from the University of Sydney. We will be both co-chairing this event. So in terms of the overview of this discussion, um, we have invited uh, three people who have worked in this space to uh, talk about what we know about automated decision-making in social security and employment services. Uh, and I will, Terry will introduce them um, in due course. However, I have to uh, apologise first that uh, Professor Dorta Carswell from the University of Aalborg in um, Denmark is unfortunately ill and is unable to be with us today. Um, and so we will be having some input later from um, Simone Casey from ACOS around the use of digital technologies in employment services. Um, but I also know that people such as Joe Ingold, um, Greg Marston, have also done work in digital um, employment services and may wish to contribute later on in today's session from their own experience. So um, I'm putting you on notice, both of you. <laughs> uh, and the, so today's structure is having some academic input, but we also have input that is really focused more on, well, what does it mean uh, for these digital technologies from the field, whether it's from um, practices, uh, practitioners, professionals, advocacy bodies. And we have three people uh, from that field. Uh, Terry will be playing uh, more of his legal practitioner role rather than his ac academic role uh, in that place. And the whole purpose of this discussion is to really build the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence, um, understanding of what's going on in automated decision-making and social services. And we'll set aside the, the, the half of the um, workshop for a discussion. And that's one of the reasons why we've left this event to be fairly much a closed event rather than a public event and deliberately including people who have diverse experiences to share around this topic. Um, and I just want to acknowledge a number of our uh, attendees. We have uh, attendees from a wide range of non-government organisations. Uh, and I won't go through all of their names there. We have, a, obviously, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the colleagues of ours from the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making in Society. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we also have some attendees from government, from Services Australia. Uh, so welcome to you. And I think there may have been some additional one to joining us overnight as well. So. Uh, please feel free to contribute to our discussion, all of you, uh, as we move on to the second part of today's activities. I guess the first thing is to say, where does this context fit in? So social services uh, is a focus area of the Centre of Excellence. Um, the purpose of the social services area is to look at the way in which automated decision making is being used in social services. And we consider social services to cover a wide range of areas. 
This is the second series, the first series, uh, for the second of a series of um, events like this. The first one we held in November last year, and it was around mapping automated decision making and child and family services. The uh, vi video of that event is available on the Centre of Excellence's YouTube channel um, and a written report, summary report of the proceedings will be available in due course. We will be doing the same for this in terms of providing the YouTube video um, of the presentations, but not the discussions. Um, and if you have any concerns about your presentation, or your involvement in that, please let us know. Uh, and we also be recording, providing a short report of the findings, particularly also uh, picking up of what the discussion talked about, what are some of the key issues that the, that the, the, the group as a whole came up. So we have, as I mentioned, already had an event on child and family services. Um, and our, we are coming over the, for the rest of the year, we're planning events on looking at disability services and criminal justice. And we're also planning a series of keynote seminars, looking at the way an automated decision-making uh, intersects with questions of gender, race, disability, and other forms of uh, social uh, disadvantage or social um, characteristics. So where might be thinking about employment, uh, automated decision making in social security and employment services and many of you people attending will be quite aware of that but for those that are new uh, we need to understand that automated decision making is really about the digital, the use of digital technologies and algorithms to automate all or parts of human decision-making processes. Um, and in the social security system, we see that being used for automating eligibility, um, entitlements, calculating rates, uh, providing payments, checking compliance. We also have risk assessment tools for risk of long-term unemployment, risk of uh, um, overpayment or fraud. Decision support systems are sometimes used in particular locations. Uh, and uh, I think as we go through today, we'll be covering some of the range of ways in which uh, uh, these digital technologies are emerging in the way in which delivery and uh, operation of social security employment services. So I'm going to hand over to Terry now. And Terry, um, I unmute yourself and um, I'll let you chair the session to, to, from now on. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. A great introduction. <laughs> My task is to uh, introduce people and keep us to uh, the time allocated time. We do have a little bit up our sleeve in one sense, in that uh, we've we've lost one of our key speakers. But uh, we want to make sure that we pick that up again uh, by extending the discussion. So, without any further ado, I'd like to. Uh, I'm delighted to. Uh, uh, welcome Christian Van Veen, who's uh, the Director of the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project at uh, the Centre for Human Rights and Global Justice at uh, NYU University. And we've got a, a nice little slide there, I see, thanks to, <laughs> thanks to Lata, our support person uh, up in Queensland. Uh, I'm down in New South Wales, uh, uh, a long way away. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Christian, the floor is, uh, is, is yours and uh, your 12 minutes uh, starts about now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Terry, for, um, for inviting me and for the kind, uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'm based in New York, uh, as you might have uh, gathered, so it's uh, late afternoon for me. Uh, so I don't have the uh, startup issues that you might be having over there, uh, but I have end of the day issues getting tired and uh, <laughs> <laughs> longing for dinner. Um, so I've been working on uh, issues at the intersection of uh, digitalizing welfare state and its implications for the human rights, mostly of poor and marginalized groups uh, since 2017, roughly. Um, at that time, I was a senior advisor on the mandate of the United Nations Special Rapporteur in Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, uh, your fellow Australian, uh, Philip Alston. And um, in UN uh, country visits that I organized uh, both in uh, 2017 to the United States and to the United Kingdom in 2018, uh, we started addressing the implications of digitalization in the state, mostly in the area of social protection. 
Um, and those visits, especially the, the one to the UK, resonated very much with, with various civil society actors who started writing to us uh, after those two uh, country visits. And we made the decision to devote a what is called thematic report to the UN General Assembly on, uh, on digital welfare states and human rights in the fall of 2019. And that was a report for which we um, held extensive consultations. We uh, ultimately were able to get input, written input from about 60 actors, including about 20 governments, civil society actors, academics from, uh, from a total of more than 30 countries. Um, and I think that report still uh, is a good summary of a lot of these uh, issues that we're um, uh, discussing today. Um, as Terry just said, I also lead a project at NYU which further investigates systems of, uh, of digital welfare and the human rights implications. Uh, and that also tries to uh, be a hub for students, researchers, and practitioners, very importantly, uh, to discuss these issues and um, uh, to further raise the sort of human rights impact profile uh, of, uh, of, of digital welfare. So my contributions today are based on both my uh, UN experience and experience on my, uh, on my project. Now, uh, to, to briefly start off on um, the question I've been asked to answer, namely, where is ADM being used in income support and employment services, and in what way is it being used? Uh, I must uh, admit that I often have problems with terminology in this uh, in this field. Uh, it's not a particular uh, criticism at uh, at the question here, but but more generally speaking. Uh, because despite Paul's um, uh, definition just now, there's obviously no official definition of automated decision making. And um, what I tend to see in discussions like this is that that can relate to a whole range of technologies on the on the cooler spectrum of things to sort of more mundane uh, uses of technology. And um, what is also, I think, relevant here is that that whole term uh, decision making is not as fixed as we would like it to, to be, I think. I mean, I have a background in administrative law, and obviously in administrative law, the term decision is fairly well uh, defined. Uh, but I think in this context, it's obviously broader than just uh, a decision under domestic administrative law. And so again, sort of the scope of what we're talking about enlarges as a result of, uh, uh, of that. And, um, and then to say, as, as Paul also underlined, when we say automated decision making uh, in this particular context, uh, there are hardly any cases of purely uh, automated decision making. There's no total automation uh, as of yet, so there will always still be humans involved in these uh, systems in some uh, way. Uh, second sort of caveat to make uh, before I start about sort of the, the examples is, is, is knowledge related. So, um, while the whole process of automating decision making in social security is not a new phenomenon, as we probably know, um, I do recognize that the surge in attention to these issues is fairly recent um, and probably sort of overlaps with my, uh, my, my own sort of being drawn into this, uh, into this field only a few years ago. And perhaps because of that only very recent spike in interest in these, uh, in these issues, uh, um, it, it's, it's quite striking to see how little um, we still know about uh, automation in government in, uh, in, the, in respect to social welfare. Uh, and to give you just one example from my home country of the, of the Netherlands, just a few months ago, uh, our general audit office, uh, this is a government office, released a report on uh, the use of algorithms in, uh, in central government and, uh, and concluded, quote, that they deliberately did not aim for a complete inventory of all algorithms used by the central government simply because that would be an undoable task. So they, they, they scratched the surface, uh, in other words. And so I think it's telling that, you know, a relatively well-developed modern state like the Netherlands, there's still fairly little idea overall of what kind of uh, automated decision-making is taking place within the, within the state. Of course, that's changing now. We see more and more reports coming out. And then a uh, final caveat is that we often tend to discuss um, uh, automation in relation to Western states. Um, yet my own research and that of others indicates that it's definitely not uh, a, a phenomenon exclusively uh, happening in, uh, in the West, uh, even though we know far less about what's happening outside of the, the West, so to speak. So with those caveats in mind, there's a few 
brief things I have to say about where uh, ADM is used in income support and employment services and in what way. Obviously, this is just a brief overview. Uh, and for me, it's helpful to categorize uh, ADM in relation to the different tasks of the state uh, in, um, in, those, uh, in those areas. So first of all, there's identification. Uh, obviously, in order to, to pay out benefits, governments require that individuals verify who they are, what their official identity is. And uh, that process of identification uh, and verification of ident identity is increasingly automated. Uh, one uh, example, for instance, is uh, the development by the government digital service in the United Kingdom of the Verify uh, platform for identity verification uh, by government. Um, that is a system in which private identity providers were accredited uh, by the government to plug into an online platform to provide identity verification services. And uh, an individual wanted to access a government service, say benefits, uh, then needed to verify her identity via this verified platform, which often involved being directed to uh, the private uh, provider's website, entering personal information, which was then um, matched with available public and private databases uh, to verify whether someone was real and uh, said who she was, said she was. And um, uh, that system is now probably going to be turned off because of frequent failure. Um, second category of um, uh, uh, tasks in which uh, automation happens is eligibility determination. So in order to pay out benefits, uh, governments require that recipients are eligible to receive those particular benefits, um, again, quite obviously. And um, whether that now happens in a government office or uh, from your home uh, online, uh, part of that determination of eligibility is increasingly automated, especially in the, in the West. Uh, so for instance, this comes from a recent report from the United States. Um, state governments in the United States have adopted algorithm-driven uh, decision-making to assess disabled people's eligibility for home and community-based services under uh, the Medicaid program, for instance. Uh, another example, which we also quote, quote in the GA report, is uh, the province of Ontario in Canada, uh, where the legislative framework for the Ontario Works uh, Welfare Benefit Program was transformed into, quote, multiple drop-down menus and checkboxes in the social assistance management system so that the software's algorithm can evaluate the data entered into these fields and produce decisions about an individual's access to benefits. Uh, that's from a, a thesis by Jennifer Razzo, a very impressive Canadian scholar. Uh, then there's payment calculation, uh, and that's closely related to eligibility uh, determination, yet I would like to sort of separate that as a specific task in Social Security uh, uh, administration. Uh, so how much does a uh, beneficiary receive in benefits on a regular basis, which is obviously uh, something that's uh, subject to change depending on changing circumstances. Now, again, for instance, in the context of Medicaid benefits for home and community-based community services in the United States that I just mentioned, uh, an algorithm is not just used to determine eligibility, but also determine the amount of assistance that an individual receives, either budget or uh, in-kind uh, assistance. In the United Kingdom, uh, where you have the universal credit digital welfare system, uh, benefit payments are calculated by comparing tax authority data uh, with uh, the data that uh, the benefit authorities hold on beneficiaries via what is called the real-time information system. And that also allows for the automation of calculations. And that also allows the system to fluctuate payments uh, on a month-to-month -month, uh, basis based on what someone earns. Uh, then another task that's relevant here, I think, is conditionality compliance and uh, sanctioning. Uh, so as you will know, most social benefit systems nowadays attach conditions to receiving payments, uh, especially where it relates to working age uh, benefits. And increasingly, we're seeing that automation is happening uh, in relation to compliance with those conditions. So, for example, in Sweden, uh, uh, two years back, it's been reported that benefit authorities there, unemployment benefit authorities, automated the process of checking whether those on unemployment benefits uh, actually met their conditions. And they also issued automated warnings and uh, sanctioned automatically um, uh, when they failed to comply, which from a report from Algorithm Watch. And in Australia, uh, which you probably know better than I do, uh, what I find interesting is that in the cashless debit card pilots, 
which of course have as their whole raison d'etre to ensure that uh, those on those uh, cashless debit cards only spend their benefits on the right kind of expenditure. Uh, I understand that the government um, not so long ago uh, piloted together with a company called DX. C uh, technology software that would enable the government to automatically block specific pur purchases of forbidden project products like uh, tobacco or uh, alcohol. It's of course also about uh, uh, ensuring compliance with conditions attached to benefits. Then there are two more uh, categories that uh, uh, bear mentioning, I uh, think. One is fraud detection, which was already mentioned by Paul, of course. Um, so I think this is a big uh, category. I think a lot of social security authorities are prioritizing their investments in, uh, in new technologies in ways to reduce uh, various forms of benefit fraud. And, uh, and that's where you see a lot of automation as a result. I was involved myself in litigation in my home country of the Netherlands around uh, legislation and a system that was called system risk indication or Siri in short, uh, which was um, a legislation that allowed uh, government actors to combine a broad range uh, of, uh, of data held by uh, public authorities uh, and combine that into an algorithmic risk assessment tool uh, that assessed which beneficiaries of low income welfare benefits uh, were more likely to commit benefit fraud. And, um, and we can talk a bit about the outcomes there, but that's a good example of what's happening in many many countries. So, uh, and finally, just to briefly flag, uh, there's the area of adjudication. So cases in which someone seeks a remedy um, um, for decision taken in, uh, in the welfare context, we see increasingly that there's automation taking place there as well. The US Social Security Administration, for instance, is experimenting with the use of AI uh, to uh, sort of streamline uh, appeals processes. So let me briefly talk, uh, Terry, if, uh, if you allow me uh, a few more minutes about uh, the human rights dimension. I was sort of <laughs> trying to summarize, but it, it's hard to get sort of to avoid getting stuck in examples uh, here. Um, so I think since we're only recently understanding sort of the breadth of uh, uses of automation technologies in the, in the welfare state and social security specifically, it's also fairly early days in understanding that there's a major human rights dimension to this um, um, that's not yet fully understood. I remember when we visited the UK and meetings with um, members of, uh, of the administration, Department for Work and Pensions, for instance, they looked a bit puzzled when we said that one of the major themes of our visit, of a UN human rights visit, would be about you know, benefit administration and digitalization. They really didn't get that uh, at the time. And so part of my project has been sort of raising awareness about the human rights uh, threats that are involved here. And in terms of that, I think one recent bit of positive news was that the EU Commission uh, just released a proposal for regulation of artificial intelligence in which they acknowledge, I think in part due to our uh, extensive uh, lobbying there, uh, that automation in, uh, in relation to social benefits um, and the use of AI there is a high risk uh, endeavor, which I think is a positive step forward because it means more protections. I think there are three major human rights related risks that I want to flag here first. I think often not fully appreciated in these debates is that in my view, the most important threat, the most important human rights threat here relates to exclusion uh, of the most marginalized individuals from access to social rights altogether. Uh, and I think uh, sort of that deliberate or inadvertent cutting off uh, vulnerable people from government help with the use of new technologies uh, should be a priority uh, uh, human rights issue that we uh, that we address. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a one big obstacle to addressing human rights violations in this uh, in this area, and that is lack of information combined with the complexity of the subject matter here. Uh, in many cases that I've been involved in, it's difficult to find out what happened in the first place, uh, let alone understanding what has happened and who is responsible. And just to, to mention one example, the serial litigation I was involved in. The complete lack of information on how that algorithmic model uh, worked led the court in that case to lament uh, in the following terms. It was unable to assess the correctness of the position of the state of the precise nature of Siri because the state has not disclosed the risk model and the indicators of which the risk model is composed or may be composed. 
In these proceedings, the state has also not provided the court with objectively verifiable information to enable the court to assess the viewpoint of the state on the nature of Syria, which is pretty damning uh, critique. In a report on Medicaid that I just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, there's the following quote. In 2012, attorney Richard Epping at the ACLU of Idaho began receiving call after call from people who discovered that the state had slashed their Medicaid benefits, but had no idea why. That's a pretty fundamental problem to doing uh, human rights research and advocacy. Final point to make, and I think uh, an important realization in relation to these issues, especially in Western states, uh, is that they are often uh, sort of experiencing what some economists call uh, being in a no growth economy. Uh, and that means that there will only be increasing pressure uh, to control welfare state exp expenditure in the future. And against that background, I think the use of digital technologies and automation uh, to save costs, the pressure to do that will only increase in years to come. And I think for anyone who cares about human rights, uh, that means we have to do more than just react to problems that emerge after the fact. I think we also need to be more involved in discussions upstream on the transformation of the welfare state as a result of these pressures and to formulate what you know, human rights friendly uh, digital welfare means uh, for future, future systems. So we need to be more uh, responsive to that call than we have been in the past. Uh, let me stop there. Sorry to slightly go over there. Thank you very much, Christian. I muted myself. <laughs> uh, yes, very good. Uh, the, uh, we, we, we ran uh, for about uh, 20 minutes. Um, you probably uh, uh, realized, um, Paul. Um, very pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, Paul uh, Henman, who's our next speaker. Um, he's a chief investigator on the uh, Centre of Excellence uh, at the University of Queensland. And uh, for uh, he, he modestly says for about 20 years or, or so, a few decades, he's been um, uh, working on uh, the nexus between digital technologies, social policy and public administration and implications for citizens in particular. Um, but uh, uh, I've known his work for, uh, it seems to me, all my life and uh, uh, impressive it is. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours and uh, your time, your uh, 20 minutes or so, <laughs> no more, <laughs> starts now. Uh, thank you very much, Terry, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I have to say that, as uh, you might so Terry's introduction might suggest, this has been a passionate area of mine, um, and I don't need to, I guess, go through uh, my past work, but I guess I wanted just to, to say, firstly, that I my training was in computer science before doing a PhD in, so, in social policy and social, sociology. And part of that PhD involved an ethnographic study of the then Australian Department of Social Security. Following that, I worked in the Department of Social Security and then which became FACS and FACSIA uh, and then FACSIA, I think. Um, and so over that long period of time since returning to, uh, to academia, I have continued to be interested in the way in digital technologies are used by the government. Um, and most particularly in the area of social security, social welfare. I guess in terms of this, um, Christian's covered very much a great expanse of what digital technology is doing. I want to go more in terms of the specific, more specific, but historical. So it is not, it, digital technology is not new. For example, in the UK, the National Insurance and Pensions uh, Agency introduced um, digital technology in 1959 to start to automate and to manage their, um, their, their cases, their, their uh, contributions, etc. Australia introduced uh, and started paying electronic payments in 1967. And uh, in the early 70s, the social welfare local authority social welfare organisation did start to introduce technologies in the, uh, in the early 1970s. Um, as a result, as technology has changed and uh, made new opportunities, we see the introduction of new changes in, in services so that with network and online systems, we had teleservice centres emerging in the 1980s. We have uh, uh, large scale data matching occurring in the, um, the 1990s. And, and we, at the present time, 
we've got uh, uses of smartphone apps, voice recognition, and um, and chatbots uh, coming into play. Um, so obviously uh, there have been uh, new developments in, in digital social security. One of those has been um, the RoboDebt or the online compliance system um, that we've that has been uh, in the national um, attention for many years, and I won't go over that. Uh, those that something that may be less uh, visible to people, and now um, Services Australia colleagues may and David Brown may wish to speak to the Welfare Payment Infrastructure Transformation Program. Uh, it's a one and a half billion dollar program that's covered over five, seven years to actually upgrade and provide greater flexibility around uh, policy and service delivery. Importantly, there's a huge uh, intersection of modules uh, through the use of um, external providers. And in the employment service areas, which I think uh, Simone Pacey will be talking about later is the, the use of new models for online employment services and targeted compliance frameworks. Um, so one of the key things I've been grappling with is, well, what does this digital technology do to the nature of social policy? What does it do to the changes in the way in which administration occurring? And what does that mean for users of the system? So the first thing to know is that technology is largely introduced in a way to automate. That's the first thing. That's the first thing it wanted does. And um, as Christian said, that, that automates eligibility and pay rates. And then we found in the early, early 1980s, a case where the computer, uh, the Department of Social Security computer cancelled an age pensioner because they, uh, in an automated way, um, and uh, and cancelled their payment of the age pension because that person hadn't returned a letter which wasn't registered in the system. Now that went uh, to uh, to the federal court um, because the person said, well, this was a uh, uh, wrong cancellation, it wasn't legitimate. And the court actually decided that they couldn't overturn the decision because the decision to cease was not made by a human. It was made by a computer, and at that stage, the law did not recognise a computer decision. And so since that time, you'll find in Australian, in Australian legislation, the uh, authority to delegate the secretary's power to both human and computer decision makers. Um, a key part of that automation is also the codification um, of policy and, that, uh, and the codification uh, policy has reduced uh, discretion, but at the same time, it's helped to increase consistency um, and also importantly, has been helpful for understanding uh, uh, citizens' rights about, particularly in countries where there was high rates of discre discretion and social assistance, the codification has been really important for recognising rights. The second area I think that's really important to understand is that we have seen a greater growth of differentiated and targeted policy and service delivery. This is driven partly by the need for personalised, uh, also triage, um, and underpinning a lot of that targeting is both uh, risk profiling. For so, for example, since the 1990s, we've had the Job Seeker Classification in Index, um, but also, as Christian mentioned, we have uh, risk profiling in terms of overpayment um, in social security systems as well who is the people who are likely to do that. And early on, they were based on heuristics that people had, and more recently, it's been developed through data mining processes. Um, the third element is that we see a greater use of conditionality so that um, we can make benefits conditional on different behavioural or circumstances and use computers to help do that. What's significant also is that we see increasingly cross-portfolio conditionality. So for example, we've had proposals in Australia for um, parents receiving child payment um, or family tax benefit to uh, have that ceased if their child is truanting from school or if they're not immunised, et cetera. Here we see two different policy areas, education or public health and social security, social insistence being brought together. And this has only been made available through our digital networks uh, that are able to match these data. Both these two elements of increased complexity uh, uh, have led, led to increased complexity through both the conditionality and through the 
uh, differentiation of policy. And more recently, um, the big administrative data that's been uh, made possible over the many years and decades of uh, our systems has led to greater big data analytics to understand the dynamics of welfare. Importantly, to try to work out how do we intervene early on, um, just as we know in early intervention and health um, and disadvantage can be quite very useful. And that's the idea that's underpinning the New Zealand um, social investment model. Um, and key to those is the introduction of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, how do we think, make sense of all of those things? What in terms of conceptually, what are the ethical, legal, social implications? Now, I don't want to rehearse uh, these things, but there is a, a been a, a groundswell of interest in um, thinking about the ethics and human rights implications of digital, of, of, of artificial intelligence. And I, this is a really welcome development because um, uh, artificial intelligence has come along and really raised questions about, well, what does this mean for our operations of governments? What does it mean for operations more broadly by commercial sectors? But the important thing I want to make clear is that the issues that are relating to the use of artificial intelligence or uh, emerging possibilities for artificial intelligence, machine learning in social security are really just an extension or a continuation of the of the non machine learning non artificial intelligence algorithms they really the question is how are they being used and for what purposes and so we need to make sure that it's not the ai that is really matters and though the ai adds some new twists to it these issues are very much long standing issues that have been largely neglected until this more recent phase and I want to emphasize that because you can see on the bottom left hand side of my slide that a report in 2004 from the Australian um, Administrative Review Council wrote about automated assistance in administrative decision making. So it has been a, a consideration for many years. But what are some of the implications? And I think I just want to go, there are quite a lot, we don't want to go through all of them. But I want, firstly, we know that privacy and data protection is something that's been dealt with and considered for many times. Uh, and related to that is also the question about surveillance that people talk about multiple times. The other aspects, and I think we were reinforcing Christian's first point about access and um, is about how do people access these systems when they become increasingly complex? When we have a computer culture that says the computer is right, uh, it, the computer tells us it has accurate information, it must be correct. Um, which can become a burden. I've seen that in my own research about um, recipients of Centrelink not questioning the, uh, uh, the competence of Centrelink officers and not the competence of the computer when it's uh, been IT systems that have been the problem. Uh, and this can lead to what Michael Lipsky calls the bureaucratic disentitlement, where it's not the actual, the actual policy or the legal things that disentitle people, but it's the processes, the administrative burden there are also challenges about acting on risk prediction. Um, the, so risk prediction is a, is a prediction, it's not a reality. Um, and we need to be careful about the way in which we do things, particularly if we do it in a, um, we introduce coercive types of behaviour based on assumptions about what people may do in the future. If we do it in a supportive and a facilitative way, then, then that's not as problematic. The other problem with a lot of risks and predictions, particularly uh, that are used in other areas like child protection, is that they're not dynamic. They don't pick up on when people's change of circumstances. And we need to think about how do we build, develop uh, modelling, predictive modelling that can be more dynamic and take into account ways that people have changed so that they are not always blighted by their past history 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and also use those systems to a way in which to enhance people's capacities to, um, to be better in what they're doing. We also, there's a lot of discussion about algorithmic bias and the way in which algorithms embed assumptions about the world, whether that's by computer programmers, by machine learning. There's questions about accountability and transparency and the idea that computers are black boxes and whether that undefines or challenges the review and appeals process. Uh, and the important thing about in human insight. So we had humans that made administrative professional discretion decisions to recognize the diversity of people. 
we moved into a one size fits all uh, process and uh, people said we need to have that differentiated capacity. Now we moved into a one algorithm fits all approach where we think even though different people are different, we can differentiate our policies, but we know increasingly from uh, our AI research, such as facial recognition, that they do well on certain groups of people, but do poorly in others. And similarly, we need to start to think about how do we design our system so that we actually flag different types of people that are, that are not dealt with by the algorithm, but are you dealt with and supported by people, just as the way in which banks might automate a whole range of things, but for people who have complex situations, they might go into a bank branch and work things out. Uh, the last two things I think are important to do, think about is the way in which we can design uh, technology. Who is it designed for? So typically we have designed our systems from the interests of government, the interests of the administration system, um, but how do we design it for people? So for example, um, there's been research looking at the way people using the child support system about you know, are there apps that help people as, as separated parents manage their situations uh, that helps them manage their child support relations. Similarly, we need to think about what are the ways digital technology may help a Centrelink recipients uh, or social security recipients manage their relationship with Centrelink? How do we help them to know what they need to know? Um, an example of Centrelink, of Services Australia, Centrelink website has been a continual bane because it's actually not user-friendly uh, for standard English. Uh, and that's something that could easily be dealt with. And the last thing I guess I wanted to mention is the importance of power. Um, when we're dealing with disadvantaged populations, um, there is a tendency to, for political power to overarch that. So we introduce technologies to disadvantaged populations that we wouldn't consider introducing to the tax system. Um, and so for example, robo debt is one of those things. And an example where the digital technology uh, created significant changes, but it was more the politics around that, more uh, less that, uh, that created that problem um, rather than the actual digital technology itself. So what do we major considerations for future of digital social security? First of all, it's not just about the technology, it's about the intersection of the technology, humans and power uh, and uh, politics. Um, how do we, get accountability when we increasingly have industry partnerships involved. So when we disperse accountability and responsibility to private sector, how do we engage with that? Um, what is our capacity to challenge the accuracy of the code? So for example, RoboDebt showed the way in which individuals could question their own decision, but there was no systematic way to actually challenge the code itself. We don't have the legal capacity to do that. Class actions can be helped, but they actually don't question the, tech, the code. They question each individual decision. Um, I mentioned just dynamic risk profiling. Also, um, I mentioned about uh, making social security systems, the digital systems that are user centric. Um, uh, and the last thing I guess is how do we move towards legal governance and digital oversight of the overall system. And I think the new uh, um, guide for artificial intelligence led, uh, drafted by the EU provides some really interesting insights that we as Australia could, could consider. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, spot on time. <laughs> and uh, I can now hand back to a, a competent chair who doesn't uh, mute themselves half the time <laughs> um, uh, to take over uh, the, the last three of us who are speaking. Um, so it's all yours, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Terry, for chairing that session. So I'm going to introduce Terry. So. Uh, Professor Terry Carney, Emeritus Professor from the University of Sydney School of Law. Um, now, Terry, rather than being his Emeritus Professor role, we've asked him to talk with his, uh, his experience as a lawyer involved in the Social Security Appeals Tribunal and the Australian Administrative Appeals Tribunal to talk about the way in which technology uh, uh, impacts on the adjudication processes. So thank you, Terry. 
Thanks, uh, Paul. Just about the couldn't share until it came up. Uh, you should now see my uh, slides. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'll try to um, uh, get across this in uh, five or six minutes at the at the most, if I can, uh, because uh, there's a lot of detail uh, on these uh, slides. So you've got the uh, the outline of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, and I guess the take home uh, message is that um, as uh, both of uh, the previous speakers have indicated, there are a whole host of, of issues um, that need addressing uh, to get the balance right between the undoubted benefits of uh, AI, um, which ought to uh, outweigh uh any uh, concerns and limitations but in the early stages at least in some of these sectors um uh the the lack of attention i guess has uh, led to the the problems becoming um significant and um i guess the message the message is uh, that uh, in the area of uh, employment services um the Difficulties probably at the moment are outweighing the benefits and uh, regrettably uh, for lawyers, but no surprise to non-lawyers, uh, none of the existing um, institutional um, review and other arrangements seems up to the, up to the task of um, redressing even the individual concerns, much less the systemic ones that um, uh, Paul uh, and uh, Christian have uh, uh, outlined previously. So, um, the, by way of some backgrounding, um, I've done and others have done work in this uh, space. Um, uh, Mark Considine's work uh, over many decades uh, sets the context for people uh, not familiar with Australia. Uh, on the fact that Australia was the first and still I think is the only um, country in the world to fully privatise um, the task of uh, finding uh, employment, helping people to find employment when they become unemployed. Um, in other countries, it either remains as a, a government, uh, fully government, or it's partly uh, privatised. Uh, and uh, the full um, contracting out of um, employment services um, magnifies some of the um, uh, problems because of the, uh, the number of private uh, sector providers that are involved. So uh, there are certain features there that um, uh, you can see on this slide um, of the way employment services and AI fit together. Um, we in Australia um, uh, were early adopters and uh, vigorous adopters of activation, the activation policy from the OECD many decades ago. Um, so, so there is a lot of conditionality uh, that comes part and parcel of giving people the opportunity to um, develop skills and so on that might help them to get back into the workforce, which is the, the theory of the, the positive side of activation. Um, that um, the, one of the implications of um, contracting out a service is paradoxically that um, a government um, usually proliferates, pr proliferates much more than the old uh, internal government regulatory system. The number of relationships that uh, government imposes upon the private uh, provider of the service um, and uh, their design to ensure value for money for the government, but also that whatever policy settings are reflected, like activation policies, and that people who um, uh, don't follow the rules, um, if there's a sanction involved, that, there, um, that, that there's some fairness in the assessment of um, whether the sanction, uh, the reduction of payment or the stopping of a payment uh, is appropriate. So all of that adds to a, um, that, that complexity, I guess, that um, Christian, uh, 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 talked about uh, earlier uh, today. 
Um, so it's a very complicated system and one where that uh, individuals find it difficult to, uh, to navigate. So looking at the AI challenges quickly, um, we have a tool uh, to predict the level of um, uh, difficulty, if you like, that the person who's become unemployed is likely to face in uh, uh, returning to employment. Uh, so that uh, you can calibrate um, uh, the level of uh, service that is provided to the person while they're unemployed to help them back into work. Uh, and of course, um, that relates to how much the government is going to pay the provider uh, to provide uh, that uh, service. Now, statistical profiling uh, has a, a whole host of uh, difficulties in this area, the international research, some of it is cited there on that slide. Um, uh, canvases um, the the issues that um, that uh, arise um, when you when you try to uh, develop um, uh, a tool. Our our tool in Australia is a logic uh, logistic regression tool, um, and so it's actually less sophisticated and therefore has. Uh, more chance of being uh, of leading to unintended or inappropriate results than would be the case if it was a machine learning um, AI um, uh, method. A number of overseas countries, uh, um, their tool is a machine learning tool. It's not unproblematic, but it's less problematic than one like the Australian one, which, uh, um, as I say, is a, a logistic regression uh, methodology. And of course, um, like, like overseas, no transparency um, as to um, the, the underlying calculations. Uh, we could move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so um, the number of people who've written about, um, you know, the sorts of issues that crop up in uh this this type of taxonomy of uh, artificial intelligence in in this sort of setting i won't take you uh, through that uh, the piece by michael uh, by uh, uh, simon chesterman is uh, particularly um uh helpful and uh, paul's own work that uh, he's already touched on uh, but uh, um in indicating that problems magnify as you move from uh mere automation uh, and go up through the more sophisticated um, uh, <laughs> range of options up to the um, machine learning and other um, uh, more complicated, I suppose is the short way of putting it. Uh, and um, as the, uh, the Alston report, the UN rapporteur, um, um, Philip Alston's report on the very distinctly dystopian um, view of um, automation in welfare. I mean, it's, it's, it's arguably too dystopian, but not, uh, only by a tad. <laughs> and uh, uh, it indicates that the, it's not just Australia that is confronting um, uh, the need to um, think about uh, how to address these uh, risks, but um, it's a worldwide um, uh, phenomenon uh, in the in both the uh, the Western world and uh, um, more so uh, in uh, in less developed uh, countries. Okay, so what 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 can law and um, the administrative appeals tribunal and so on do to fix this? Well, the short answer is uh, really not much. Um, there has been a long history of digitization. Uh, in welfare and in uh, welfare uh, administrative review on the tribunals. Um, but um, the AAT uh, does not have jurisdiction over the most sensitive uh, and critical, well, not sensitive, critical aspects of um, uh, life for an unemployed person dealing with um, a contracted out employment service provider. Um, so, for example, um, the AAT is not allowed to um, uh, consider or review um, a decision by the uh, instrument that determines the uh, degree of difficulty of finding you a job 
Uh, so if you uh, actually have a much more complicated um, uh, situation and need a great deal more assistance than you're getting, uh, and that your problems are because uh, you're on one of the lowest levels of funding uh, for your provider, um, and that's what's giving you angst, really, and giving your provider angst. Uh, there's no way that you can go to the AAT as an individual and say, um, I want this um, classification reviewed. Um, there are internal uh, 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 departmental processes, and they usually work pretty well. But um, if push comes to shove, there's no way you can go to the external re um, referee, if you like, the, uh, the tribunal, and have uh, that uh, decision reviewed. Um, th there's a number of others um, uh, to the same effect um, that uh, bear out my point that um, the things that really matter most to uh, an, in an unemployed individual on uh, our job seeker payment, as we now call our new start payment, um, can't really be um, addressed at all, or if they can be addressed, they can only be addressed at the periphery. Um, so there are some decisions that the tribunal can look at and say, well, we don't think this is right, um, but you can't remake it the way the tribunal thinks the decision should be made. It can only just, it can only be sent back uh, to be uh, uh, remade. Now, usually that works, but um, uh, there's no guarantee in the sense that um, the tribunal normally uh, delivers. So moving uh, to the next slide, thank you. Are there any solutions? Um, <laughs> uh, really, really not a lot. <laughs> um, and I canvas uh, material that's already been um, uh, talked about today by uh, Christian on some of the overseas legal challenges uh, to systems. Um, we don't have anything uh, akin to the uh, EU's, uh, uh, either their recent recently released or um, leaked standards, um, or even the uh, general data protection, uh, that's what the GDPR stands for, regime, um, all of which um, go some way, at least in Europe, uh, towards uh, addressing some aspects, particularly the privacy, some, some of the items on Paul's list and uh, Christian's list of uh, areas where, you know, more thought and work and um, uh, systems and ideas need to be developed. Uh, it's a blank space, uh, that one uh, for us in Australia. Um, but actually, any in any event, I'm not sure, and nor are most of the uh, people whose work I read overseas, not too many people are confident that these legal solutions are really any significant part, a major part of a solution. Um, they are one small part, but anybody who thinks that um, adopting uh, the European regulations in Australia would be a panacea, um, frankly, I think is living in la la land. Uh, that's that's my point. Um, and and it's not just me thinking that you're living in la la land in uh, believing that um, <clears throat> lawyers and new laws or new legal avenues is the main part of the solution. This, uh, as I read the international literature, is also um, you know a, a pretty strong view <laughs> uh, worldwide. So uh, I've gone longer than I intended, but if you go to the, uh, that very last slide, um, <laughs> uh, this is what uh, the um, EU's leaked draft um, um, uh, regulation is proposing. And uh, yes, uh, as Christian said, it identifies these sorts of areas and the sorts of issues I've been just skating over and saying we can't really solve through uh, tribunals in Australia. Uh, it says, yes, they are uh, really high risk. Um, it's labelled as a, a high risk um, uh, um, area um, of administration uh, and social policy generally. Uh, but uh, the EU's regulation uh, doesn't go beyond um, self-regulation. 
uh, of the uh, balancing out of the risk against the protection. Um, yes, it. I mean, it's a 40 or 50 page regulation. It takes you half a day to read it. Um, but, uh, and it is quite good in, in delineating on the one side, all the things that are risky. And uh, on the other side, you know, identify some of the avenues for uh, um, uh, dealing with that risk. Uh, but at the end of the day, it says it's a really high risk <laughs> area, this, uh, uh, social, this aspect of social policy, uh, because of the very vulnerability that Christian um, uh, mentioned uh, uh, of um, um, the uh, Social Security recipients or the unemployed seeking work, etc. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's it's super high risk. But um, we'll leave it to um, self-regulation in the main to um, to provide the remedy. And um, you know, <laughs> I think uh, most people are looking at the way self-regulation operates in other high-risk areas. You know, would have, would have a number of. Uh, big question marks about how adequate that might be. I, I love my uh, cartoon on, um, you know, robo debt. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's what we want to avoid. We, we don't want um, the brilliant potential of AI in, in, uh, to be crueled um, by lack of um, attention, either in the um, formulation within government or elsewhere of the, of the measure um, or of um, public uh, policy in considering uh, what machinery we need uh, to ensure that there's uh, balance and, and remedies and so on. Thank, thank you. I'm so, I apologise for straying over, but uh, that's me. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Terry. Um, uh, now it's my turn to introduce Dr. Simone Casey. So Simone has recently joined ACOS, the Australian Council of Social Service, as a senior policy advisor. ACOS is also a partner organisation of the Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making in Society. And Dr. Casey was formerly of Jobs Australia and recently completed a PhD looking at employment services. So welcome, Simone. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, thank you for the organisers for including me in this event. I'm really excited to talk about um, digital developments in employment services. Um, and I particularly today just wanted to um, help you visualise what this looks like from the point of view of, <clears throat> sorry, people using those systems um, and to explore some of the implications of digital employment services from the um, by using a short case study. So we seem to have lost my slides, um, but while um, we're getting them back, um, I'll just go through my background in a little bit more detail. So yes, I'm currently um, a Senior Policy Advisor at ACOS. And prior to that, um, I uh, was a Research Associate at Per Capita, um, and I had a period volunteering for the Unemployed Workers Union as a Policy Advisor. And prior to that, I um, was at Jobs Australia for 14 years. And there I had the opportunity to observe um, digital transformation of employment services over a number of um, decades. And towards the later part of my tenure at Jobs Australia, I also had the opportunity to get very close to and learn a lot of the detail about the targeted um, compliance framework, the rollout out of that. And I undertook the same training and immersed myself in the same guidelines to understand the, um, the system from the point of view of the providers. Um, so I've also observed all of this digital transformation with interest as a student of welfare conditionality, the ethics, the efficacy, um, the, the distri distribution of power and the locus of decision-making control in employment services. So I'm totally fascinated by this whole subject. Um, and I'm gonna try and walk you quite quickly through what digital employment services look like in Australia today. You'll have to excuse my croaky voice. <clears throat> so first of all, the um, important thing to understand about um, the Australian context is that we're, <clears throat> excuse me, well way through a digital transformation that is significantly shifting the way that employment services have been administered in Australia to date. 
um, this has been part of a, a transformation process that's been underway for a number of years. Uh, and in July 2022, we will move to a new, completely new model where there'll be three types of services and only 50% of job seekers are expected to continue to be using face-to-face -face services. The others will use digital services um, and where in which they will have access to various levels of support from um, a contact center, which is actually be running by, being run by the government, by the Department of Employment. So that also uh, signifies a shift um, to some renationalization of employment services to some extent. However, the people who are using digital employment services, and there's been quite a number already because we've been in um, the stage of various trials over the last couple of years, and also with the tsunami of unemployment from COVID uh, last year, there are a large number of um, unemployment claimants who were um, un placed into digital employment services. So what does that look like? So on the next slide, um, we have um, an image of the digital dashboard. Um, yeah, so most people using digital employment services engage with what's called the digital dashboard. Um, and so that's really like, you know, a one-stop shop visualization of what your job seeking requirements are and the extent to which you're maintaining your compliance with those um, job seeking requirements. So when the targeted compliance framework was introduced in 2018, um, the existing job seekers were um, assessed at, for their digital readiness um, by basically just assessing whether they had access to a digital device at the time that they were asked the question. So, um, so most job seekers, whether they're receiving services face-to-face -face, will be using some form of digital interface regarding um, relating to their job search requirement. And it's really quite significant in Australia that the first digitization initiative focused on maintaining job search compliance rather than um, anything else that might be related to um, trying to find a job. Now, I have to say the digital dashboard that I'm showing you on the screen now does include elements further down where you can set up sort of job matching um, alerts and so on. Um, and there are quite a few different sort of AI and nudge technologies behind this now, which will, um, you know, offer you jobs or offer you motivation to be, you know, increasing the number of activities you undertake and things like that. So this is what the digital dashboard looks like. And this is the real, you know, the cornerstone technology of digital employment services um, in, uh, in the present. And as we um, complete the transformation to the new employment service model in 2022. So you can see on that screen, we've got a, um, a dial that in, in this case has some, shows some red points on it. And this means that the person are using this dashboard has um, accumulated demerit points and demerit points are, are part of the targeted compliance framework, which show you, um, which accrue until you actually receive a financial penalty. But you do actually get payment suspensions when you fail to meet a requirement and then you are required to engage, to undertake a re-engagement activity, um, depending on what the, um, the failure to complete the original requirement was. Um, and that's really quite significant because what I'm going to talk you through in a, in a second is what happens when that goes wrong. Um, the, the dashboard also shows you what your, your current job search effort is. So in Australia, we have a, um, a default requirement for most job seekers to undertake 20 job searches per month. Um, and that means uh, uploading evidence of having applied for a job rather than just ticking a box to say that you did that. So you actually have to supply documentary evidence. Um, the, the dashboard also shows you what your tasks are, so provider appointments and so on that are coming up. Um, yeah, so on the next slide, I'm just going to sort of talk you through a little bit of a scenario when things go wrong, when you're unable to maintain your compliance um, with the requirements that have been set for you. So the first thing that happens is that your payment is suspended um, and you have to complete um, a re-engagement requirement. So this screen is showing you um, what's in the some of the, um, 
the guidance provided to job seekers about what you know um, how to navigate or negotiate things on their digital dashboard. Um, so if your payment is on hold, which is a new terminology we've been using for payment suspensions, it tells you that you have to complete your requirements. So the red box is saying, um, in this case, that the person has to complete 10 job searches to get their payment back. And I'm going to talk about the significance of that in a second. Um, and then there's also another banner that comes up saying um, you've got one demerit point. So at, at this stage, we can already see that as soon as something goes wrong in a, a job seeker being able to maintain their compliance, they're already getting these warning messages and they can't proceed and do anything else until they've done the thing that they hadn't done in the first place. In this case, it's failing to meet the, re, um, the required number of jobs, job search job searches. So what happens then? Um, and I'm just talking you through this scenario, um, really just to provoke a bit of thinking or as a teaser to some of the issues that are arising, um, have already been arising um, through the use of these digital interfaces. So on the next slide, um, what happens? Um, so this case study really is showing you, so if you haven't um, completed your 20 job searches in a month, and you've got seven more to do, um, what happens then is that those seven are added to the 20 that you have to do in the next month. Now, I'm concerned about this because this starts to make job searching even more onerous than it had been. So it basically accumulates and accumulates over um, one month to the next if you haven't been able to complete those job searches. Now, this is called uh, the re-engagement requirement. So it's a requirement under social security law but it's a requirement that's decided by the Secretary of the Department of Employment and then codified into the system so that it automatically accumulates on the dial that people um, you know, are then seeing on their interface. Now, I currently have an inquiry with the Department of Employment um, about the policy intent here. Is the policy intent really to um, add on those seven, seven job searches or has that somehow been included in the system because of a, um, a system design assumption about the policy intent. Um, so I'm really interested in scrutinizing the detail about what this what actually happens when people are using these interfaces and how that pol the policy intent is translated um, into um, a requirement on a digital dashboard which a person can no go, go no further to get their payment back until it has been completed. So um, as I say, I'm um, currently having an inquiry with the Department of Employment and some of the detail around this might not be 100% accurate, but I have flagged it as a concern to say, well, is this the actual policy intent of the targeted compliance framework or has some assumption been made that's built this into um, the, the, the job seeker dashboard now? Um, so this scenario is really just something I just wanted to use to, as a teaser to think about what digital employment services look like. Um, so I started to think about this as a digital dystopia that you can't get past um, the computer saying no until you've completed job search re-engagement requirements. Um, and so that's um, really just to, to open up some thinking and conversations about what this all might mean in employment services. So I wanted to draw your attention to um, an article that I had published in the AJSI, which I called um, Towards Digital Doll Parole. Um, and uh, also just the current um, inquiry into Parents Next, it's a human rights inquiry. And so many of you who have um, been interested in the Parents Next case and the application of the targeted compliance framework to the Parents Next, um, will have already been made aware that there are um, have been human rights concerns um, raised because of the application of the targeted compliance framework and the digital dashboard to participants in the Parents, Pro Parents Next program. So that's me, thank you, and sorry for the croaky voice. Thank you very much, Simone. I uh, appreciate that. It's uh, really interesting to see what uh, is happening in uh, employment services. Uh, I, was, I was intrigued to hear the uh, uh, Tinder-like approach to um, employment matching. So I wonder whether you can swipe left or right to the jobs that you get. 
Uh, so our, our last uh, person contributing to the voices from the field is Daniel Turner. So Daniel is a senior solicitor from the Welfare Rights Centre, University of New, uh, New, New South Wales, not the university. Um, so welcome, Daniel. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Paul. <clears throat> and um, just reflecting on um, that presentation by Simone, I'm, I'm very grateful that I'm not looking for uh, employment in, in this market and having to comply with those obligations. It's, it's actually uh, terrifying. Um, so I work closely with people, obviously, as a solicitor for the Welfare Rights Centre in Sydney who are uh, in receipt of Centrelink payments. And um, uh, I'm going to take a bit of a I'm a risk and go a little bit off uh, off script because uh, I've been reflecting and taking notes on a lot of the presentations, um, uh, particularly by um, Paul and Christian have um, um, uh, brought to mind a number of examples that um, I confront in this space assisting people. Um, the, uh, the, the main concerns, if I could just kind of put them under a heading around automated or assisted decision making is really about transparency and accountability and the ability of people to um, uh, understand the decision that's been made um, and effectively challenge that decision. So um, uh, as we know, or as we may know, um, I know Christians worked in, worked in this, uh, worked in the area of administrative law. Um, uh, one area that I, I guess, when I was thinking about this subject, I was thinking technology, well, that's all very um, uh, complicated, automated decision making, I don't know much, but in fact, um, on a regular basis, I engage with um, uh, assisted decision making technology uh, used by Centrelink officers in relation to decisions about overpay recovery of overpayments. Um, and uh, um, the tools which are used in this area are referred to as um, what we know as an ADEX, um, a schedule or a multi-cow and, and what they do is they assist the decision maker to calculate um, an overpayment and uh, arrive at a debt figure. So the information is inputted in terms of income information and that is um, uh, compared, uh, then the system compares what a person receives in terms of their entitlement um, uh, as against what's they, what they ought to have received and they spit out a, a figure which is the overpayment amount. Now, um, the, the tool is undoubtedly helpful for um, uh, officers within Centrelink in making that decision. Um, but unfortunately, when a person requests um, evidence of how the decision was arrived at, what they're provided with is in fact the raw outputs of that system, not an explanation. And the, the document that, that we have to contend with um, as solicitors in this area and spend a lot of time, spend a lot of time trying to work out and translate um, contains, it's full of acronyms, which are only known to users within uh, the Centrelink system. Um, they often don't include critical information like the income that was used to actually calculate the debt, which is absolutely vital to um, trying to scrutinize the decision. Um, and, uh, you know, reams of documents that are completely um, a, a person who's um, the subject of one of these decisions is completely incapable of interrogating um, and certainly even um, the uh, 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 lawyers in this area have, have a struggle dealing with it and certainly the AAT I've seen had, um, struggles to deal with it as well. Um, so um, the, in terms of the design of these processes, they're all well and good, but we must uh, bear in mind that they need to be transparent. They need to be, um, those, the people who are subject to these decisions need to be able to scrutinize it. And the fact that they, um, they cannot um, impedes their, um, their, the exercise of their review rights. Um, it's a very fundamental that a person is capable of understanding how a decision was arrived at, um, a decision that affects them. And in relation to debts, um, you know, there's a, there's a, it, the, the explanation is lacking significantly. Um, and this leads to a kind of a, another phenomenon and, and Christian or, or Paul may have referred to this as um, this deference to computer decision making that recipients don't question decisions made by computers. So when they're confronted with a document um, with um, pages of documents, which have a lot of numbers, contain a lot of um, jargon, terminology that no lay person would know or never heard of before. They, they, uh, the impression is that this is very technical. Um, it must be right. 
Um, and that sort of cognitive bias is um, a, a significant problem. And we see it um, at all levels of the review process where um, internal decision makers and even external decision makers um, treat these documents or decisions made by debt with a great deal of deference. And we see uh, decisions affirmed regularly, which are incorrect because they have not been scrutinized and they've not been scrutinized in part because it's uh, next to impossible to scrutinize the decision. Um, so often if evidence is not led before the tribunal um, to show that a calculation is correct, it's taken to be correct. And that's, that's very problematic when the person who would be leading that evidence would be um, the, the, the Centrelink beneficiary, um, who's very unlikely to be, be in a position to be able to scrutinize the decision itself. Um, so that's that's a bit of a bug, bug bear. It's been around for a long time, and Terry sat on the tribunal would be very familiar with these documents as well. Um, uh, I did want to reflect on the the complexity of decisions in social security law. Uh, mean that a degree of automation um, and assisted tools are, are absolutely necessary. But um, I've confronted a, had a case very recently, which. Um, uh, involved an individual who had their payment suspended for a period of eight months um, and they, their um, carer was in fact someone who'd worked for Centrelink for, for many years, no longer did, but understood the process and was advocating on his behalf and for eight months they could not rectify the issue and in fact what the issue was, um, uh, no one was able to explain to him or understand what the problem was. It was in fact a a lock, um, an IT problem. It was a lock um, on, on him receiving payment, which could only be identified and rectified by a, a, an IT person going into the system and list, lifting it. That's, that's a person eight months without um, income support and was in absolute dire circumstances um, because of this, um, uh, this um, technological problem, really, um, and that, that couldn't be understood. Uh, that couldn't readily be understood what was going on. So, um, you know, that's a significant concern. Um, look, I think that, you know, there's a lot to say in this area and that, you know, the discussions coming up and I look forward to participating in that. I could go on forever. I've been taking so, so many notes, you know, so many thoughts are arising as, as, as everyone's talking and, and providing input into this and, you know, reflecting on employment services and the decisions that are made in that space and the lack of accountability. Um, Ter Terry's absolutely right. There's, if someone comes to us with a problem with their employment service provider, there's very little that we can do about it. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and that's a real problem because people are in a position where their payment is suspended, uh, where the decisions are often lacking in rigor um, uh, uh, and uh, unappealable. <laughs> so um, that's my input for the moment. And thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join in, into this discussion. Following these presentations, we then turn to a roundtable discussion about some of the issues raised. We have not provided those discussions for this recording. However, we were fortunate enough to be able to get a copy of Professor Dorda Caswell's recording um, that she was going to contribute to this event. So please stay and watch this, con this contribution. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dorda Caswell, and uh, I'm going to give you a brief lecture on the Danish Social Employment Services uh, Developments, Dilemmas and Dialogue. Uh, I'm the prof a professor in sociology and social work at the Aalborg University in Denmark. I'm based in Copenhagen, and this is uh, the beautiful picture of our campus. Um, <clears throat> so I'm talking uh, on the basis of a couple of uh, big research projects that I've done along with the uh, Professor Fleming Larsen uh, um, and a lot of other researchers and municipalities in Denmark. So the first uh, is an innovation fund project called Lises uh, and since 2020 we've been doing um, uh, this uh, collaboration between research uh, 
at uh, Auburn University uh, and uh, a number of Danish municipalities uh, under the headline of COOP, which is a Danish uh, abbreviation, uh, but uh, the same sort of headline, local innovation and social and employment services in English. Um, uh, one of the main uh, focus areas in this um, way of doing collaboration is that we do research on uh, the unemployment service uh, services in the municipalities and uh, the focus of uh, of the research and the practice development is to make uh, more user involving services um, so so the sort of overall headline is is to develop uh, better and and more qualified but also very much uh, more user involving services uh, in in uh, in the municipalities and uh, and uh, one of the the ways in which we've been doing it is uh, to change the way we have a dialogue between research uh, as uh, knowledge producers uh, and practice. Um, so rather than uh, thinking that researchers should uh, develop uh, knowledge and, and find out what works and then hand the solution over to the municipalities, uh, we, we uh, Go, go from it, come from it from a different perspective, and uh, an idea is to uh, develop a dialogue between what is known uh, in and through research, and also what is knowledge in practice. So we have this overall model uh, about uh, mutual uh, innovation and learning platforms, where we bring together uh, researchers and practitioners, both on a manager level, but also on a frontline uh, level. Um, and recently, we've also started to develop these learning platform with clients. Uh, so we meet with clients and have this uh, dialogue between uh, uh, clients and their kind of knowledge, their kind of experiences of the employment service and the researchers. So we have, uh, I think up till now, we've done about 140 of these learning platforms. Uh, they take uh, about two to four hours uh, every time. And uh, the sort of overall frame is that researchers come in to the meeting with particular uh, kinds of knowledge, maybe analysis we've done ourselves or knowledge or uh, concepts that we uh, have uh, gathered from the existing research. Uh, practitioners come in uh, to the meeting uh, to the platform with uh, their interest in the particular area that we will be discussing in this platform. Um, so this is a way of uh, developing knowledge. We as researchers very much take um, an in-depth understanding of the um, nuts and crannies in in the in the practice, all the dilemmas that occur in uh, the day-to-day -day practice, uh, with us, and can take that into the research and develop our analysis with this knowledge. But uh, practitioners all, also very much take away new reflections from the meeting in these platforms. Uh, we talk about knowledge as something that disturbs uh, practice and moves their per perspectives in a way that enable them to see uh, perspectives of things they haven't necessarily been aware of before. So this is an ongoing um, uh, movement between knowledge in research and knowledge in practice and the development in this particular direction of user involving services in the Danish municipalities. Uh, as I said, we've done this for a number of years and the status uh, at the moment of the of the data is this is not even updated. So, so we have uh, about 125 observations of meetings uh, with clients in the different municipalities. We have a lot of meetings that we've observed uh, in the municipalities, management meetings, uh, uh, professional um, team meetings uh, by the frontline workers, etc., etc. And then we've done these uh, learning platforms. And as I say, this is not updated. So I think we've we've just turned 140 of the platforms. Uh, a lot of interview with clients, again, uh, slightly unupdated. I think we've had 45 uh, interviews with clients at the moment. Uh, and then we have these learning platform clients. And we've also done uh, a number of what we call positive deviance cases. So um, Clients who have previously been um, uh, vulnerable and far away from the from the labor market, but who have managed to get uh, into the labor market either on special terms or, or on uh, 
uh, normal jobs or even uh, some of them in education. So basically clients uh, that, that have come from a very marginalized position have entered this politically and, and societally preferred position of uh, participation in the society uh, in education or uh, employment. Uh, and we've interviewed these clients. We've also interviewed their frontline workers uh, and tried to find out what, what has happened in these processes. Uh, are there any sort of common uh, explanations of, uh, of this uh, pattern of moving uh, towards employment and education. Uh, I've published uh, an article along with Sufi Daneris and that can be found on, on the website. Anyway, um, throughout this uh, process of working uh, with the municipalities, uh, we've had very close dialogue with the management, uh, both uh, in uh, particular or, uh, municipal organizations, but also uh, across the municipalities where we arrange annual seminars. And we've also done a lot of talks with the local political committees. Uh, and an important point to make here is that throughout the whole process, and this is uh, going back to 2016, uh, we've had these municipal organization uh, with complete full and open access for uh, researchers. So basically, uh, we can enter any kind of uh, arena in the municipalities, which enables us to understand the practice in ways that we have previously been unable to. Um, just to give you a brief uh, tour of the developments in the Danish societal, uh, social and employment services. Uh, so just starting from the 2000, uh, there's been an increasing focusing, focusing on these social uh, disciplining approaches, uh, on labor market participation and sanctions, as we've seen uh, throughout uh, many parts of the world, uh, and also an increasing focus on the role of the labor market, both uh, the employers uh, and actually activation uh, in uh, companies, individual placements support etc. Um, we've also seen a constant expansion of the target group, also a thing that's not particularly Danish. We've seen that throughout uh, the world. We write about it in the book uh, that uh, Fleming Larsen and I edited along with Peter Kupka and Rick van Bergel, that we see this expansion of target groups in many different uh, worlds, uh, parts of the world. Um, but that means that at the moment we have in Denmark a client group uh, where a, a quite a big proportion of, of clients would previously be identified within the realms of social policy, uh, but are now uh, in, within the employment services um, or benefits go through the employment services. 2007-2019 uh, is an important uh, point of time in Danish history uh, and the municipalities uh, take over the employment policy previously. Uh, the um, Job ready, uh, insured, unemployed people were uh, the state business uh, and the um, uh, cash benefit recipients uh, were um, the municipal business. But since 2007 and fully in 2009, the municipalities have full uh, responsibility for the whole of the employment service in Denmark. Um, interestingly, and slightly absurd. Uh, this whole organizational change uh, was based on a deep distrust in the municipalities. Uh, and so along with it came a, a huge uh, governance uh, structure um, uh, with benchmarks, with extensive data collection about performances, a lot of uh, regulation of processes built into legislation, etc., etc. And talking about digital uh, um, elements of, of employment policy. This is an important element for in the Danish case that this kind of governance has only been possible because the Danish society is thoroughly digitalized and there's data uh, on everything we do uh, based on social security numbers on individual levels. Um, so uh, there's a lot of data to draw out and uh, make uh, these uh, or base these benchmark etc on. Uh, 2016 uh, there's a change in the reimbursement um, of the municipalities, so the money that the, the municipalities will get back from the state level. Um, previously, initially, it was basically the reimbursement were built around activity level, so um, levels of activation, percentages of active uh, uh, clients over time uh, was the initial uh, point of 
departure for the reimbursement from uh, uh, followed afterwards by a sort of what works phase where it was very focused on the kinds of activities so um, labor market oriented activities would give a higher reimbursement uh, and also a number of meetings with clients would give a higher uh, reimbursement but to, since 2016 that all changed and since 2016 uh, it's all only been based on time so we have what we call a reimbursement ladder so the first year there's a relatively high reimbursement from the state to the municipalities afterwards um, it, the level falls uh, and the municipals are left almost entirely uh, responsible for the financial side of clients um, but also uh, in this uh, since 2016 onwards uh, also part of the whole push towards new uh, public governance uh, we've seen an increasing focus on co-production and increasing fo focus on the role of the client and this idea of using involvement user involving services um, and at the moment as we speak there's a, definitely a, a policy area on the move uh, the present minister uh, of employment so um, employment policy uh, has uh, launched that there's going to be a, a big political reform uh, after the summer holiday uh, and actually the first part of this uh, political uh, agreement has just been uh, decided prematurely really uh, because it came before it was uh, decided that it should be coming uh, so uh, part of that is uh, uh, um, saving money uh, uh, mainly on uh, the group of young clients, uh, particularly the ones with mental illness, and also on the um, um, refugees and immigrant group, uh, the elder group of that, a uh, part of that group uh, is the sort of main um, areas that will be uh, where they want to save money uh, and they want to move some of that money onto um, ensuring that people who have uh, worked hard uh, are uh, more easily access to to uh, uh, early retirement pension or disability pension um, and also to to um, even out uh, the kind of uh, financial uh, support for families. Uh, so, but this is very much on the move uh, at the moment. Uh, just to give you a very brief detour, detour about the digital elements of the Danish society uh, in, in employment uh, services, uh, I've uh, put in these the three uh, links that are built within the the. The PowerPoint, I'm not going to go through it, but it's obviously all in Danish, uh, apart from the job effector. The first one is is uh, is in English as well, but the other ones are in Danish, but it will g give you an opportunity to click on the link and, and see the sort of digital uh, setup of, of uh, these platforms. Um, but uh, I put these three different um, um, digital um, arenas uh, on because I think they are uh, interestingly uh, different elements of what goes on in the Danish employment service uh, in terms of digitalization. So the first one is knowledge, uh, a knowledge transfer attempt from the central government, the Danish Agency for Labor Market and Recruitment, uh, with a strong focus on evidence. Uh, and it basically collects uh, randomized controlled trials and quantitative effect studies and, and uh, uh, it, it wants to create an easy to use platform for the municipalities to click in to uh, deciding what is the right um, um, measure to use for particular client groups. Um, I could say a lot of critical stuff about this, uh, uh, but I won't at the moment. It, it, it is uh, not widely used uh, in the municipalities. Uh, the, the central government agency is, I think, still, still quite proud of it, uh, but it, it, uh, it is, um, it's, it's been uh, challenging uh, in terms of use. Um, Yes, I won't say any more about that. Uh, the second uh, platform um, is a very influential, uh, very strong uh, data source. Um, it's used for lots of things. So the municipality uses it all the time themselves. They use it to keep track of their own development, how many uh, cash benefit cases do we have? Is there a development uh, over time? Uh, how many sickness 
benefit uh, claimants do we have? Uh, what about our level of uh, disability pensions? Is that going up or down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this kind of platform is possible because of the Danish digitized society. So as I said before, we have all have a social security number, which means that everything is collected. And I know that uh, at, in some countries, when we explain about this sort of over, uh, over data uh, collected society that we have, uh, it sort of scares uh, people. <laughs> but, but I think from a Danish perspective, we have strong faith and a lot of trust in our central government. Uh, so, so, um, it's not really uh, discussed uh, in, in the Danish society that it's problematic that these data are available. Uh, but in this context, uh, it, it enables a quite a high quality of, of data uh, to be used uh, both on the municipal level, but also very much used on the, on the national label. So this, is, this job in sets is used also for the benchmarking and uh, very often used for like a naming and shaming uh, uh, benefit of uh, use so basically uh, the the minister would could, could come out and say well this municipality and this municipality are very low on the ranking uh, this municipality uh, does not use sanctioning enough and and uh, so so there's um, it's it's used on on many different levels um, uh, and also used for research often um, so a uh, strong influential data source uh, that is also uh, sometimes challenging in the way it's used. And then uh, the last level I will talk uh, about is, is the individual level. Uh, so there's uh, something called My Plan, which is a digital overview of uh, of all information about plans for employment service for the uh, for each individual client and the client him or herself can access this. So anything that's written in My Plan uh, is available for the client him or herself. Uh, uh, some municipalities that we work with are very actively using this My Plan uh, also in a way to change the way they write about clients uh, to include the client themselves in this uh, digital uh, knowledge about themselves. So it's part of, uh, of the JobNet, uh, which is also the, the, the digital platform here developed. Uh, but but uh, this is uh, basically um, uh, meant for... Uh, the individual to have access to what goes on uh, in the um, in the welfare state uh, that regards themselves, and we have uh, as Danish citizens also access to our health data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is, uh, I think, a natural element of a Danish society that is thoroughly digitalized, and where we have, um, uh, yeah, we have an e-box where we can everything uh, that is sent from the from from the uh, central. Um, the, welfare state to to us uh, is accessed uh, we have our pay slips there we have everything uh, on this uh, e-box so so the job net and the my plan is sort of the the employment service part of that individual access to knowledge about myself that the state or the uh, welfare state the, the municipal level will hold about me and write about me um so a central element uh, or dilemma in, in the Danish employment service is this uh, lack of responsiveness uh, that is uh, addressed very strongly, uh, both on the on the central level and on the municipal level. Um, it challenges the legitimacy of the current system. Um, at the moment, we have... Um, I think across all p parties and, and in the public opinion, uh, this uh, demonized job center. So basically the job centers are pointed as uh, towards as, as uh, the problem and the, um, but, but there's a reason that, that this lack of responsiveness have, have built up over time. Uh, it's challenge. It's a challenge. It's definitely a dilemma, but it, it's this, it's there for a reason. Um, so, over time, municipalities have been forced to develop a focus on implementation and production. Uh, so there's a strong bureaucratic financial and performance management from control from the central level that I've already addressed. There's also performance and result-based management uh, and very comprehensive monitoring, uh, partly made possible by this uh, uh, jobinsets.dk um, that is available and visible for everybody to see. Um, there's been over time, uh, 
and is at the moment extensive legislation. Um, uh, I think they, there's a, our f- a famous Danish politician, Margrethe Vestager, who is now in the EU, once said that uh, they use a shovel to cr- create new legislation and they uh, take away uh, the problematic rule with a pen set. Uh, so, so basically, uh, it builds up over time. Um, so there's been numerous uh, attempts to simplify and de-bureaucratize, uh, but uh, overall it's still a very uh, extensive uh, legislation. Um, and what we see is that this all uh, tends to reduce the ability of the system uh, and the frontline worker to actually listen to the client. Uh, I'll go very briefly towards this. So this is just going back to to where I started with the coop and the leases projects. Uh, these potentials uh, are uh, what we have been focusing on in our research and also what we have been uh, uh, working on in our uh, dialogue with the municipalities uh, and rather than come up with the quick fix solutions as a researcher uh, what we tend to do is to open up dilemmas and understand dilemmas uh, and and uh, create the opportunity to uh, develop a reflexive practice around uh, balancing out these dilemmas. Um, I've written an article along with Fleming Larsen uh, that goes through all of this so I won't be going into it uh, but the important uh, point I think here to make is that rather than seeing this as, uh, you know, developing particular projects, particular measures that work, particular uh, um, focus points, uh, the whole point of, of what we are trying to do, and I think we we tend to say that that what is what needs to be done is to make system innovation. So we need to address all of these level at at the same time, which is challenging, obviously, but uh, in order to make change and create create more use involving uh, social and employment services, we need to address all these different kinds of areas. Um, so just to finish up, uh, I've talked about this dialogue between research and practice and and uh, what what have we found so far. So one point is that moving from the focus on single interventions to these broader political organizational uh, context, uh, moving from project innovation to system innovation tends to create uh, an opportunity for uh, more development uh, in the municipal organization uh, in this direction of user involving services. Uh, it's also an important point that, that the, this is done through the dialogical knowledge production. So uh, the first digital platform that I talked about, the jobeffector.dk, which is the evidence-based uh, resource for, for gaining knowledge about what works, is a very strong knowledge transfer idea that you build in, uh, in a particular system, the access to what works. Um, but there's resistance and, and um, lack of use of this kind of knowledge. So while this knowledge might be very relevant and uh, and may have the opportunity to change, it doesn't uh, get implemented. Uh, so the idea, and we here lean on and a vast uh, knowledge, um, re- research uh, on, on knowledge mobilization, uh, also from other areas, uh, uh, the health uh, sector is, is uh, a lot of knowledge about or a lot of research done about knowledge mobilization social area etc um so uh, one of the ways we've been doing this is uh, that we've uh, worked with particular frontline workers uh, that we define as knowledge brokers uh, so uh, frontline workers uh, who are uh, more closely engaged in the dialogue between uh, with researchers. Uh, at the moment, we have about 50 knowledge brokers uh, in five municipalities uh, that we work with. Um, and we see that the knowledge that's developed uh, and, and picked up from research uh, is uh, very quickly moved into the organization because these knowledge brokers carry this re- uh, this research knowledge into their everyday practice. Um, also, uh, the problem-based learning approach uh, is, is uh, central to the way we produce new research. So we, we tend to, uh, when we have these uh, 
platforms, we uh, we discover problems that needs uh, analysis, uh, and it is a discovery uh, of problems that uh, sort of is shared between the organizations and the researchers, and then the researchers can take these uh, problems back to our research desk and and develop uh, new knowledge, uh, find out uh, you know uh, do literature reviews about what we know about that. So, but but because the the it's problem based uh, then the the municipal organization are very interesting interested in getting this research knowledge back once we have developed it um so there's a lot of uh, yeah as a smoothness in in uh, the the how we move between these different universes of practice and research um and I think the third and last point is this uh, necessity to have active participation from, from frontline workers and clients uh, when designing and developing uh, social employment services. So rather than uh, leave out the frontline, leave out the clients, uh, they need to uh, be part of the development uh, overall.